I believe it's a battle for the soul of America. I believe it is a battle that says that what kind of country are we going to be now? Are we going to be one that listens to Latinos, Asians, African Americans, Native Americans, gays, lesbians? Or are we going to be a country that is authoritarian, homogeneous? A political prisoner is one who, for the most part, is incarcerated because of his or her political beliefs uh, and some type of uh, uh, action that uh, is in opposition to the United States government. We define a prisoner of war as an individual who is a member of a nation or a citizen of a nation who is struggling for national liberation against U.S. imperialism, for example, Native Americans or Puerto Ricans or New African Independence Movement, and who engages the enemy in some armed military action. And for the most part, they are part of the military clandestine formation. And uh, therefore, when they get captured, in most cases, they take the position that they're prisoners of war who are captured in a battle for national liberation. This is American justice. Yes, right. This is American democracy. Yes, right. And those of you who are familiar with it know that in America, democracy is hypocrisy. Right. Now, if I'm wrong, put me in jail. Right. But if you can't prove that if democracy is not hypocrisy, then don't put your hands on me. Right. Democracy is hypocrisy. Right. If democracy means freedom, why aren't our people free? Right. If democracy means justice, why don't we have justice? Right. If democracy means equality, why don't we have equality? Right. Black people should understand that the new African independence movement is not new. The new Africa, the term new Africa is new. But the struggle for self-determination and the struggle for independence uh, on, the, on these shores is a struggle as old as the slavery that, of black people who've been brought here. We have to look at the history of the independence movement in Puerto Rico didn't begin with the, with the capture of 11 Puerto Rican prisoners of war. It has a history from the moment that the United States invaded Puerto Rico, 86 or 87 years ago, there has always been armed insurrection. What we are, the FALN, and all the other clandestine organizations in today that operate both in the United States and in Puerto Rico, we are a trajectory of examples that are set before us. We have learned from history. So the fact that, uh, that we've associated to try to stop the U.S. government from committing genocide against black people inside this country, against the nation of Puerto Rico, against the people of Central America, to the United States government, that's, that's illegal, that's breaking the law. And yes, according to their laws, what we've done, some of what we've done is illegal. However, some of the acts within that conspiracy are legal, legal protected by the U.S. Constitution. Faced by a people with a different beliefs and lifestyles, the Europeans who came to the Western Hemisphere have tried to defeat, confine, poison, starve, subjugate, evangelize, disperse, remove, relocate, re-educate, and finally, in a word, annihilate nations of people existing in the Western Hemisphere. Our history has been and continues to be one of militant resistance. We were once a people that were fully self-sufficient, living in harmony with the natural world. Today, we are amongst the poorest in this country with the highest unemployment, malnutrition, disease, infant mortality rates of any population group in this country. We continue to have our land stolen, our cultures threatened, and our basic human rights trampled upon. Yes, our history <clears throat> 
is one of militant resistance. And we pride ourselves <clears throat> today by following in the footsteps of our ancestors. As long as the United States government continues its policy of genocide against Native nations, so too will we continue to resist. The revolutionary philosopher Frantz Fanon says that what happens is that the victim begins to agitate. He uses all types of means against his executioner in fighting for a position of equality. After he tries a number of means and they do not work, he then begins to imitate the means by which his executioner kept him down. That is usually through force and violence. He says, and then they begin to use it against them, breaking the one taboo that they've never been able to break, hitting back against their executioners, so that you ought not to be upset. If we are violent, the United States taught us very well how to be violent. And we're going to say it after this, lock the hammer locks up, lock the everybody's locked up, that you can jail a revolutionary, but you can't jail a revolution. Right. You might want to liberate like every slave out the country, but you can't run liberation out the country. You might murder a freedom fighter like Bobby Hutton, but you can't murder freedom fighting. And if you do, you come up with answers that don't answer explanations that don't explain. You come up with conclusions that don't conclude. And you come up with people that you thought should be acting like pigs, that's acting like people and moving on pigs. And that's what we've got to do. So we're going to see about Bobby, regardless of what these people think we should do. Because school is not important and work is not important. Nothing's more important than stopping fascism because fascism will stop us all. In America, uh, black people are uh, treated very much as uh, the Vietnamese people or any other colonized people because we're used, we're brutalized. The police in our community occupy uh, our uh, area, our community as a foreign troop occupies territory. And the police are there not to, uh, in our community, not to uh, promote our welfare or uh, for our security and our safety, but they're there to contain us, um, to uh, brutalize us and murder us, uh, because they have their orders uh, to do so. And um, just as the soldiers in Vietnam have their orders to uh, destroy the Vietnamese people, uh, the, the uh, police in our community couldn't possibly be there uh, to uh, protect our property because we own no property. Uh, they uh, couldn't possibly be there to see that uh, we receive the due process of law for the simple reason that uh, the police themselves deny us the due process of law. And so it's very apparent that the police only in our community, uh, not for our security, but the security of the uh, business owners in the community, and also to see that uh, the status quo is kept intact. I go through Watts. I go through Chicago. I go through the, <clears throat> Harlem. Uh, and I see that the people in the what's called the ghetto, uh, the black communities or the colonies or whatever you want to call it, were treated almost exactly the way we just got through treating Viet Cong or Vietnamese people in Vietnam. So I begin to draw parallels uh, that the police departments in these various situations in these cities were actually the same thing we were in Vietnam, occupying forces. They didn't live in the communities. They came from another area. They didn't know the, in the inhabitants of that community. <clears throat> so, um, and they were exploiting, they were imprisoning, killing. The Black Panther Party, in my opinion, uh, was the most profound black experience in this country, other than Marcus Garvey, um, uh, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King, right? Then comes the Black Panther Party. When we first started, we had a police alert patrol, and uh, we would uh, patrol the community. We, if we saw the police uh, brutalize anyone, we'd put an end to this. Usually, the police wouldn't brutalize anyone if we were on hand because we were armed, and uh, if the police arrested the individual, we'd follow him to the jail and bail the individual out. Uh, whether he was a panther or not, and we would gain many recruits like this. So th therefore the community started to, uh, to, uh, to say that, well, these people are really concerned about our welfare. Let's get into the inner workings and the meaning of this. Let's get into the inner workings and the meaning of a black revolution and why black people have a right to take what's theirs. You can read the platform and the program 
And it's a basic program. And it simply says exactly what black people have been crying for for 400 years. One, we want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our own black communities. Two, we want full employment for our people. Three, we want decent housing fit for shelter of human beings. Four, we want an end to the robbery of the black community by the white racist businessman. Five, we want decent education that teaches us about the true nature of this racist decadent system and education that teaches us about our true history and our role in the society and the world today. Six, we want all black brothers to be exempt from military service. Seven. <laughs> seven, we want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. Eight, we want all black brothers and sisters held in federal, county, state, city, jails, and prisons to be released because they have not had a fair trial. They've been tried. They've been tried by all white juries who have no understanding of the average reasoning man in the black community. Number nine, and this is where Brother Hugh is being caught. We just want the courts to make sure that we have peers on the jury or people from the black community as defined by the jive constitution of the so-called United States. The 10 is a summary with a major political objective and that is, we want land, we want bread, we want housing, we want clothing, we want education, we want justice, and we want peace. And the major political objectives is we want a black plebiscite in the UN where the black colonial subjects will participate in dealing with, in analyzing, in projecting politically upon the racist atrocities that's been committed against black people in this nation. There are those uh, within, you know, within the independence movement that will, that are good for protest, you know, demonstration. There are go those that are good for writing. There are those that are good for reading. And there are those that have to sacrifice their lives and their families sometimes to achieve that which rightfully belongs to us, and that is our freedom. Puerto Rico is a colony of this country. The United States would, not, would never cede to that, but according to the United Nations and international law, any country that is subjugated by another country, and Puerto Rico rightfully is, the United States controls us, our economy, our education. They have attempted continuously to take away our culture, but they have not been successful in that aspect. But all the means of socialization for the Puerto Rican people are controlled by the United States government to such an extent that such a small island has become their military bastion. There are 11 military bases on the island of Puerto Rico today. Puerto Ricans who migrated to Chicago in the 1950s brought with them the political divisions that are part of the island's history. It was their children who grew up here who became the FALN. The spark was lighted in 1898 when U.S. troops stormed ashore and took Puerto Rico from Spain. America had a colony. Over the decades since, every Puerto Rican political movement to seek independence was crushed, first by the U.S. military, which at times fired into open unarmed people at political rallies, killing men, women, and children. Then by the FBI. Documents obtained through the Freedom of Information Act show J. Edgar Hoover ordered his agents to infiltrate and disrupt even peaceful Puerto Rican groups that sought independence. When you see that violence, look behind it. See why that spark comes out of the fire. Started studying the history of Puerto Rican women within struggle. If we go back to, we can go back to 1898, you know, when there were sisters, Lolita Rodriguez del Tio, uh, Mariana Bracetti, who were involved in that struggle. We can, we can go to the Nationalist Party and see the different women that were involved in that struggle. We can go to 1950 and the uprising in Hayuya. And that uprising was led in part by a woman named Blanca Canales. We can bring it up to uh, 1954 and Lolita Lebron. She went into Congress uh, when they were discussing the whole question of Puerto Rico, the whole status of Puerto Rico, and she went into Congress with three brothers and shot up the Congress. 
uh, with her little revolver. And she was a... Little? Big old 45. <laughs> it was little at all. <laughs> uh, she was, she was considered wounded, a little... Wounded five, Puerto, wounded five congressmen. She was considered a little little Puerto Rican lady, you know. Mm, and uh, she went in there and she took out her flag uh, after she'd taken out her revolver and said, Que viva Puerto Rico Libre. To become a political person, Puerto Rican revolutionary woman, is not something that happens from one day to another. It's a process like all revolutionary politics. For me to find out who I was, I had to go to the public library or, or some old Puerto Rican who tell me about who were our great men, our hero. You know, because in the school they told, oh, George Washington is your hero. I know George Washington don't look like me. <laughs> or, or, or Patrick Henry, that was nice. Benjamin Franklin, fly a kite. Bexy Rowe designed the North American flag, but they don't tell me who designed my flag. The Puerto Rican flag. So for me to find that out, I had to put that book, I throw that book through the window twice. You know, because the teacher got me reading something that if you've got a, an ounce of intelligence, you know, it's insulting to you, you know. And I throw it twice. But I went finding out until I found out that my father was fighting, doing what he was supposed to be doing because we were a colony. We were an enslaved people. The United States or no one had the right to enslave my country, to colonize my country, and that my father was right. So I became involved in that way in the same struggle of my father. And from father and son, we became compañeros too, in the struggle, compañeros in the struggle. I decided that I wanted to contribute and work in the community. So I did that by working as a community organizer. And I thought it was the advent of the anti-poverty programs, and I thought that that was going to be the answer. And it all sounded very beautiful. Maximum feasible participation of the poor. Said, well, this is it. Here we're going to bring about some change. And I learned early on, by the time I was 20, that that wasn't the answer, because the programs in itself were not creating self-sufficiency. They were creating our people became dependent on a system that wasn't doing anything for them. Then in that realm, I got involved in politics, electoral politics, and I thought, well, maybe if we had more Puerto Ricans in elected official positions, that would change. I found that to be a fallacy. Uh, my name is Alejandrina Torres. I am a Puerto Rican prisoner of war. And the reason, because I call myself a prisoner of war is because of the relation, the colonial relationship that exists between the United States over my country, Puerto Rico. National liberation struggles are never won by sitting and demanding and sit-ins. Unfortunately, there is the question of armed violence. None of us, we're not um, advocates. We advocate, yes, revolutionary. What we define as revolutionary violence or revolutionary needs, and that is utilization of arms because so this country doesn't respect anything else. So some Puerto Rican nationalists, Lolita Lebron, Ilvin Flores Rodriguez, Andre Figueroa Cordero, and myself, yeah. Yeah. I, mans I myself decided that we had to do something to call the attention of the whole world about the reality in Puerto Rico. The United States had the the money, have the little puppet all across the world, have all the means. We only have our life, right? our life. So we decided to put our life at stake as to clean the dignity of my country around the world, of my people. So we went to Washington and did some shooting inside the House of Representatives. Why they are? Because they are the ones who control the sovereignty of Puerto Rico. They, 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 they control, they impose over us the, the military self, everything, every law that comes and imposes in Puerto Rico from, from the Congress of the United States. So we went to the Capitol and may they smell some of their own medicine or taste some of their own medicine. So we went to prison. They gave us 75 years to the men, and they were nine, 50 years to the women, see, very democratic. 
50 years to Lolita, and 75 to the men in Washington. From there, they took us to New York and charged us and other Puerto Ricans who did not have nothing to do about this with conspiracy to overthrow the government by force and violence. I mean, we might not be too smart, but we are not so dumb as to think that with four little guns, you're going to overthrow the whole government of the United States, you know? <laughs> but I get you know. You can question me about the violence that I use, but at the same time, does it not bother, let's say, you or whoever the interrogator is about the violence that they perpetrate against my people and the atrocities that they have committed and the violence that is perpetrated, that is carried out every day, you know, just at the, at the mere level of survival out there. Doesn't anybody, I mean, is that what? Is some violence can be justified and other, and other can be condemned? I think it's um, important that people do not see us as these rigid, hardcore people. We're, we're human, we're mothers. Carmen has a son, I have a son. Um, and the beauty of our commitment to struggle is because we want a future for our kids. We want our children to, to live of a better life, not to be dehumanized and to have a different outlook of what life can really be about. When you look at prisoners of war and political prisoners, they, 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 they represent like the heart of our movement to a large degree. And uh, what, what you have is that the government attempts to isolate the prisoner from the masses. And what that does is almost like removing your body from around your heart, which leaves your heart vulnerable to, 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 you know, to be destroyed. And so if they can isolate the community from the political prisoner or the prisoner of war, particularly once they're incarcerated, then they can generally do what they want to do with them. Personally, um, I was subpoenaed by a grand jury and asked to give um, testimony about, to give information about what Black Panther Party members and Black Liberation Army members were doing. And I refused to um, testify before the grand jury. And I went underground as a result of it, ending up in prison doing eight years, um, serving a 40 year sentence, of which I did eight months and eight years in maximum security, three years and seven months of that in maximum security segregation. What became very clear during those, that time that I spent in prison was that people did not, not understand what was really happening with political prisons. There's a very, very um, different level of treatment for people, political people who are in prison as a result of their political beliefs and affiliation than there is from people who are in prison as a result of criminal activities, whether it is because of the social crimes or whether it's um, economic crimes. There's a very, very different kind of treatment. Our political prisoners and prisoners of war are not allowed to, to go to school in most cases. They have to fight for everything that is allowed to the, the, to the worst um, uh, uh, the person who would miss, could miss mass murder in our society um, gets better treatment than the political prisoner in the prison of war. So what it is is that the government is afraid of its political opposition, and so when it gets the opportunity, it tries to bury them within the confines of these institutions. And once they get them in the institutions, that is not enough. It then puts, it tries to isolate them, and it, it, try, it attempts to destroy them either psychologically or physically. And in many cases, as you know, prisoners have been killed, prisoners have been psychologically destroyed and tortured. And so uh, 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 this is the kind of treatment that uh, people who are political get. Oftentimes they're, they're sent thousands and thousands of miles away from home. Oftentimes they cannot get visits, uh, 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 what we would call uh, visits that you can touch your visitor. They, uh, 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 you, you talk to them on a the phone, you see them behind a glass, your uh, visits are monitored, everything you say is, 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 is recorded. Oftentimes there's prison guards who are standing there, you're under 20 hour surveillance, uh, you cannot travel through the prison without uh, 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 an escort. All of these different kind of things designed to, to keep the prisoner uh, uh, in a state of flux, which is an attempt to destroy them and to have them renounce their commitment to the liberation struggles that they represent. But for the most part, they, they are failing, and they, I think that they will continue to fail. The American justice system is a violent organization. We just have to look at the American jail system and see how, how violent 
the American judicial system is. What the government is doing now is setting up prisons that are more and more repressive, trying to set up control units that are more and more repressive, that where they create a situation where you have people living in a state of torture, 24 hour a day torture with no recreation, no um, human contact, no uh, fresh air, no uh, contact with other human beings, that they do everything in their capability to try to, to, to remove that person from a normal human environment. And that it's not, I mean, it's not just imprisonment, it's imprisonment with a vengeance. And I think that we have to really struggle to close down all of these units that are really torture units. What really is important about all of it is that you never, never surrender. And I never will surrender. I will never concede my will to struggle. Our fighters and freedom fighters have been slain in the streets of Harlem and Brooklyn. Our people who stand up for our freedom has been railroaded to prison by the same legal system that tries to protect you today and that tried to kill you yesterday. So on behalf of my brothers in prison, on behalf of the Puerto Rican nationalistas who cannot sit up here, on behalf of the Native American political prisoners, and on behalf of the white American political prisoners, I say to you, brother, we love you and we will not give up the fight. 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 Amanda! Amanda! I believe it's a battle for the soul of America. I believe it is a battle that says that what kind of country are we going to be now? Are we going to be one that listens to Latinos, Asians, African Americans, Native Americans, gays, lesbians? Or are we going to be a country that is authoritarian, homogeneous? A political prisoner is one who, for the most part, is incarcerated because of his or her political beliefs uh, and some type of uh, uh, action that uh, is in opposition to the United States government. We define a prisoner of war 
as an individual who is a member of a nation or a citizen of a nation who is struggling for national liberation against U.S. imperialism, for example, Native Americans or Puerto Ricans or New African Independence Movement, and who engages the enemy in some armed military action. And for the most part, they are part of the military clandestine formation. And uh, therefore, when they get captured, in most cases, they take the position that they're prisoners of war who are captured in a battle for national liberation. The United States is beginning to be exposed uh, as a nation which has uh, a problem within its borders. Uh, it, is, it is not the democracy that it historically uh, has been able to project itself as. And so it has to hide the fact that it has political prisoners because if it's a democracy, then there should be no reason for dissent. And so it cannot show that it has literally uh, over 150 political prisoners within the United States. But we think easily of uh, Geronimo Pratt, who was in Northern California at the time and murder committed was in Southern California. The FBI had him and other Panthers under surveillance. Now the FBI records have disappeared, so he has asked for the records that would demonstrate that they were bugging him in North Carolina at the time of the mur in uh, Northern California at the time of the murder. Uh, he isn't able to get them because they have disappeared. We charge that they were destroyed by the FBI. So here is what we believe to be a clear frame. Yeah, I'm a prisoner of war because of a secret war that was waged against the Black Liberation Movement uh, in, the, in the 60s. Basically, grew out of a pre-dawn raid on the uh, Black Panther Party headquarters in Los Angeles, California in 1969, December 8th, four days after a similar raid was uh, made against Panthers in Chicago, and as you know, resulting in the death of uh, Red Hampton and Lamar Clark. <clears throat> um, out of that, <clears throat> It was a trial which lasted almost a whole year in which we basically beat. The jury came back and said, well, the, the police, the law enforcement were in the wrong. And we were basically in the right for defending ourselves. I was not even at the shootout physically. Um, and yet I was convicted of what you call a lesser included offense. In other words, we won the case. But the, the jury uh, saw fit to... Uh, find something to keep me in prison for. What you're about to see is CBS TV's dramatization of Ro Chief Prosecutor Robert Tannenbaum's book about the killing of two New York City police officers on May 21st, 1971 in Harlem, New York. Herman Bell, Anthony Bottom, and Albert Washington, three activists from the Black Panther Party now serving 25 years to life, are portrayed as the murderers. This CBS docudrama, which first aired in 1985 and continues to run on national television today, is a carefully crafted lie. The truth is that the New York Three were wrongly convicted in a rigged trial and that government agencies are the real thugs and criminals. During the course of the trial, attorneys had made motion to bring up the issues of um, COINTELPRO, and the, and the judge denied it. He said, in effect, that we did not have any proof that we were victims of COINTELPRO. The truth of the matter is that we did not have the proof. The DA had all the proof. Should the trial be reopened, Mr. Scott, would you testify that you, in fact, buried the gun? Yes. Knowing that your freedom might be in jeopardy? Yes. Why? Because I want to tell the truth. I think there's a need that the truth needs to be known. 
with these three people. With me, I think I just need the satisfaction that I know that I told the truth. And for that, you'd be willing to serve time if necessary? Yes. I consider myself a, a political prisoner. I still believe in, in the power of the people, okay? And um, with that power, right, I, we could be out of prison in, in 18 months. If, if we don't get uh, support from people in the streets, then It'll be, I'll be 55 or 56 years before I go to the parole board. I'll just be in here riding away, and as will my, my two co defendants. Her question was just, what is the avenue that might get you released? Would it be a new trial? Would it be a presidential pardon? Uh, even public demand or pressure? Uh, do, do you have any idea on that, Leonard? Yeah. Well, since it's obvious that I'm not going to get any relief through the courts, uh, and uh, a, a good example of, of what I'm going to say right now is to look at what South Africa uh, they've just released prisoners there from international, because of international pressure, uh, prisoners that they said they would never, never release because they belong to the African National Congress, et cetera. I don't know if people, you know, you're aware of what the history is on there, what the ANC does. But uh, from international pressure, they finally released uh, a lot of these people. Now, of course, yes, some of them have done 25, 26 years. And, uh, uh, but if you really look back a few years back, a few years, there's uh, the international pressure just started four or five years ago. So this is what we have to do here. In this case, we have to, uh, you have to uh, become very committed. You have to study and uh, Memorize the legal issues. You have to uh, get out and start speaking to your neighbors. You have to. Uh, we have to build an army of people out there to put that political pressure that it's going to take to get me out of here. Who's the freedom fighter? Geronimo Press. Who's the real terrorist? Who's the freedom fighter? Geronimo Press. Geronimo G. Jaga Pratt has spent the last 18 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Substantial evidence has been uncovered pointing to a deliberate FBI frame-up. In fact, the main prosecution witness at the trial was proven to be a paid FBI informant. Despite this and other evidence, the courts refused to grant Geronimo a new trial and the parole board refuses to release him. Uh, you know, I mean, his case is just so blatant, just so obvious, just, I mean, there, there are mountains and mountains and mountains of documents that prove that he was a victim of COINTELPRO, but the man is still in prison. Um, I had been telling them all along, the lawyers, and speaking in open court, trying to make these assertions, and they were looking at me like I was ego-tripping. That would be the thing I would get back a lot. Nigga is ego-tripping. You know, FBI didn't have nothing to do, care nothing. And so I would cry. I'm in Folsom Prison in a hole. I'm in a hole here. The communication weren't that, uh, that good. So I tried the best I could. I wrote different people and uh, to try to expose <clears throat> what I knew. And I knew it was the FBI involvement. Uh, <clears throat> it was 1972. <clears throat> I think I was right in AC here, either in Folsom and 4A. <clears throat> The news came out of uh, some radicals in Reading, Pennsylvania, I think, breaking media, in, media Pennsylvania, breaking into mm -hmm. some files, and then all of a sudden this COINTEL program, and it was Watergate was happening, and we didn't have TVs and radios back then, so every now and then we would see a newspaper, and I remember seeing the Watergate burglars, and I looked on there and saw Bernard Bucker, and uh, I remember him and a couple others would be in Los Angeles a lot harassing us with the. Uh, there were a lot of anti-Castro Cubans there. 
The movement to free Geronimo Pratt is happening in courts, in communities, in Congress, and internationally. Recently, Congressman Ronald Dellums introduced a congressional resolution calling for an investigation into Geronimo's case and those of other political prisoners. In 1980, Amnesty International stated, the interest of justice can only be served by granting Mr. Pratt a new trial. Geronimo Pratt is being held for no other reason than his political beliefs. He has said, if I'd actually committed the murder, I'd be out by now. The longer I'm in prison, the more clear it is that the murder isn't why I'm here. Why won't the U.S. government set Geronimo Pratt free? On the international level, in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, it's United States imperialism. Here inside America, it's United States fascism. But it's all one struggle. All the oppressed people all over the world, regardless of color, are struggling against a common enemy. The U.S. fascist imperialist pigs. And it must be smashed, it must be destroyed, so we can institute a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that way, every man, woman, and child will have a decent life, um, the best that technology and resources can provide, and then we can uh, have all power uh, for the people. Can you cut there? Well, my name is Mumi Abu-Jamal. I'm uh, on death row in Pennsylvania. I'm ex-president of the Association of Black Journalists in Philadelphia. I'm still a continuing revolutionary journalist. I write for anybody who wants me to write for them. Um, and I'm fighting my conviction, fighting the sentence, fighting for my life, and fighting to create revolution in America. Mumia Abu Jamal, a well-known radio personality and the former president of the Association of Black Journalists, was found shot and near death next to the body of Officer Daniel Faulkner. Mumia was charged with first-degree murder and taken to the hospital. According to Jamal, his police guards tried to kill him in the hospital by severing his life support lines. Four months later, Mumia stood trial and was convicted of first-degree murder. His sentence was handed down on the weekend of the 4th of July. I'm a member of the MOVE organization and a longtime supporter. Uh, I met MOVE while covering them in Philadelphia. I mean, no one in Philadelphia from the 70s to the mid-80s can claim to not know about MOVE in Philadelphia. MOVE. MOVE advocated a back-to-nature, no-nonsense, no-technology lifestyle and refused to make concessions to the system. They were openly revolutionary and spoke out boldly against the status quo, including the police and Mayor Rizzo. Every time a move member leaves headquarters, he's followed by these persecuting ass cops. What we say is, we want an end to this persecution. We want an end to this hypocrisy of calling this the land of the free, home of the brave, while you're standing beating up, clubbing people, standing trapping people in the ground. In 1978, the Philadelphia police attacked the move compound. As gunfire erupted, Officer James Ramp was killed. When the firing stopped, Delbert Africa, unarmed and stripped to the waist, surrendered. The treatment he received was described as overzealous. He's hitting them, he's hitting them. Hitting them on the head. Hit, kicking them on the head. John Africa explains that this system will say there's nothing wrong with the system pointing guns at people, but is everything wrong with people pointing guns at the system. That implicit within that is that no one can defend themselves, but that the system can liquidate people uh, willy-nilly with no one saying a word. And they can. They've done it on May 13th, 1985. You've got more people um, liquidated on May 13th, 1985 by the state, but you've got no one convicted of murder, no one convicted of mass murder, no one convicted of providing instruments of crime. 
You've got no one convicted except Ramona Africa for survival. Because survival is a crime. What we have out there is war. And I knew from the very beginning that once we made that decision to go in there, it would in fact be war. When a black man confronts a policeman, he's not supposed to survive. He's not supposed to walk away from that confrontation. But first, the big story in Action News is the sentence of death for convicted cop killer Mumia Abu-Jamal. Action News reporter Vernon Odom was in the courtroom when the jury made its recommendation. It took the jury of 10 whites, two blacks, just over three and a half hours today to make their decision. It was death, Abu Jamal's life for Officer Dan Faulkner's. There were no emotional outbursts in the courtroom. Later, Abu Jamal shouted move slogans as he was led away. I was attacked. I was shot. I was charged with murder. I was attempted, uh, attempted to be killed in a hospital in Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, but I'm still here. You know, I was shot, I was beaten. I was uh, 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 pulled through a railroading of a trial, sentenced to death. But you know, I'm not crying, I'm not complaining, I'm continuing to fight the system. The case of Mamiya Abu-Jamal is a case where the government is trying to kill a revolutionary, trying to literally take his life and put him into the electric chair. Um, and we cannot allow that to happen. We cannot allow that to happen because it's the case of a human being's life, uh, a human being who has struggled, who has uh, dedicated his life to the liberation of his people. But also we cannot allow that to happen because it will set a precedent. And if we do not struggle tooth and nail to keep the state from killing him, then we are allowing a situation to, uh, to happen where the government can accuse any of us of any crime and put us to death without uh, any mass movement, without, you know, without even having to take into consideration that there will be hell to pay if you try to kill our revolutionaries. And I think that, that that's really important because if we allow the government to kill him, we will be sentencing so many of our youth to death. I'm here because I survived. You know, I'm here because I continue to exist and resist this system. You know, ain't no illusion. No illusion. Question should be asked perhaps if is uh, if Mumia Jamal died and Officer Faulkner was alive, would he be here? For many, many years, there's been a struggle within the left in this country and among progressive people. What do you do when your government has stepped outside the bounds of human decency and international law? Are we still bound by the, the laws of this country? When the United States was, was uh, waging war against the people of Vietnam, that was, that was what the struggle was. Did we have to just uh, limit ourselves to protest petitions and marching on the sidewalks <laughs> and coming down to Washington once a year to make our voices heard, which was good to do. But did we have to limit ourselves to that, or could we try more effectively to stop what the United States was doing? 
Well, there are a number of campaigns that are going on. I mean, you will find campaigns around different individuals, whether it be trying to stop the execution of Mumia Jamal, whether it's trying to get the release of Alan Berkman or get the extradition of Sylvia Baraldini back or getting Sundiata or Sekou Oding and them out of Marin or out of these 24-hour uh, 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 day lockups. You know, uh, it's important that people support those kind of petitions. There's international campaigns. Uh, college campus students can invite people to come in and speak and educate around that. They can raise issues with their, with their teachers. They can write the prisoners. They can visit the prisoners. We think that these are very important things to do. They can talk directly to the prisoners themselves because once you talk to the prisoners, you get a different kind of view and a, and a real feel of who they are as opposed to what the government of the United States will tell you that these people are terrorists and that they're cop killers and that they're bank robbers and all of these different things. And once you're able to sit down and talk to them and relate to them, then you begin to understand what motivates them, the, 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 the principleness and the justice that they're seeking for oppressed people, not only here, but all over the world. And uh, so there are a number of things that people can do, and these are just a few of them. May is, in May we celebrate Malcolm X's birthday. So we have to remember all of the brothers and sisters who are interned in concentration camps. And we have to tell them that we remember them, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do greetings to them. And then you all can address them and I will mail them for you. Put that information out. If there's something happening in your area that we need to do, know about, then you should let us know. Take, write articles, take pictures, document what's going on, and let us all become aware of what's happening. I think it is very important that the people on the outside must wage struggle. And by waging struggle, it makes, it allows us who are prisoners of war, political prisoners, to realize that our efforts are in concert with the will of the people. As long as our efforts are in concert with the will of the people, at least the spirit of the prisoners of war will be satisfied. Then you, when you begin to view your community as a family, then your nation as a family, then you reach those levels of concern which everybody would like to see. But it first starts with your being concerned about your mother and your father, your auntie and your uncle, your grandmother and your grandfather, your son and your daughter, your sister and your brother. Then on from there, their sisters and their brother, the extended family, the humanitarian concern, all this is based on one thing. It's based on love. Comrade Nelson Mandela, the political prisoners of the United States, especially African-American political prisoners, have written this brief statement to you and has asked me, as one of their former comrades in prison, to present it to you. There is a common thread and a common humanity that we all share. My brother, I have spent 19 years in prison in the United States for my political beliefs. And you, sir, you were the symbol that helped sustain me and other African-American political prisoners. Here in the United States, African-American people and their movements for liberation have been criminalized just as the ANC was criminalized by the racist, fascist apartheid regime in South Africa. Our fighters and freedom fighters have been slain in the streets of Harlem and Brooklyn. Our people who stand up for our freedom has been railroaded to prison by the same legal system that tries to protect you today and that tried to kill you yesterday. So on behalf of my brothers in prison, on behalf of the Puerto Rican nationalistas who cannot sit up here, on behalf of the Native American political prisoners, and on behalf 
of the white American political prisoners, I say to you, brother, we love you and we will not give up the fight. 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 Amanda! Amanda!